Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word this evening. Yahweh, I just ask that you do amazing and mighty things through this word. God, I pray that you would redeem our hearts, our mind, our will, and our emotions to uh, properly be able to serve you in the earth realm the way that you want to be served. God, I just ask that you would be lifted up and glorified tonight, that if there's anyone in the sound of my voice that is uh, just questioning the covenants that they're following, God, or questioning you at all, Lord, I pray tonight would be a night where they would get that settled in their heart and that you would resurrect them, Lord, and, and cast your net over them and bring them back closer to your throne. We thank you for who you are, Yahweh, and we give you glory uh, for this message during this Passover time. Amen. 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 All right. Well, let's begin. Tonight, we're going to continue our Passover theme. If you haven't noticed behind you, we still have our Passover uh, uh, themes going on because this is going to be another Passover message uh, that is connected to that theme of Pesach or the, or the, uh, the spring feast days of the Lord. And so tonight's topic is going to be redeeming of the firstborn. I want to just make some generic connections to what Passover is all about, especially for those of you that are watching uh, this via DVD, and maybe this is your very first time in understanding the spring festivals of the Lord, it's critical that you know uh, some of the historical and the, uh, the Old Testament law of the redeeming of the firstborn, the kinsman redeemer. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Let's get started. Genesis chapter 1 verse 21 says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And what I want to ask is what that skin was made of. We don't know exactly, but what we see in this scripture in 121 of Bereshit is we see that something had to die to clothe Adam. Now Adam could have used all kinds of things uh, to clothe himself. Uh, but God, and he did, but God chose to use an animal, and I'm going to suggest to you tonight that it was a lamb, and I think that you will agree as we move forward. Adam was the firstborn son of God. The Creator required the wage to be paid for Adam's firstborn sin. This whole scriptural concept of Genesis to Revelation revolves around several themes, one of them being marriage, a wedding, but also a large portion of the scriptures are dealing with the firstborn. Matter of fact, there's so many Torah-based commandments and laws that wrap around the firstborn, the firstborn blessing, the firstborn inheritance, uh, the, the, uh, the sins of the firstborn, the offerings of the firstborn, the firstborn uh, that was set aside, made kadosh, made holy for God, the Levitical, for everything revolved around the firstborn. Most of the ceremonial systems revolved around the firstborn. The home revolved around the firstborn. So we need to learn a little bit about this ancient custom of the firstborn because we don't really have that custom today of firstborn inheritance. When someone dies today, when they create a will, before they die, normally it gets spread equally among the children. Not so in first century culture or ancient Israel culture where things were not split equally among the children. They were given to the firstborn. The firstborn was raised and taught and the laws of the lamb, there was no way for him to get around it. He was required to take care of his family, his brothers and sisters, as the financial advisor, if you will, with that inheritance. He was the one that was responsible. We'll begin to talk a little bit more about this as we move forward. So the Creator required from day one when Adam sinned, the wages uh, of that sin is death, as Romans 6.23 says. How many have heard of the Romans road? Right? I've led many people to Christ using the Romans road. And that is a, a key uh, a scripture, is that, uh, that for all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, but the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is through Christ eternal life. Uh, Romans 6.23. And so he required that, that, that debt be paid through a death, and that's where that first animal was uh, sacrificed so that Adam could be clothed. And so we see in the Scriptures the concept of being clothed in righteousness. 
you have to understand that you go back and use the first law of, of precedence, which is a, a Hebrew um, a hermeneutical principle or interpretation principle. And the first time that those words are being used tells you exactly what the rest of the times that it's being used, what it means. So when it says that God clothed them, and that's the first time that that phrase is being used, and then later in the Scriptures, it says that He clothes us in righteousness. There's, they're making a connection between the animal that was sacrificed in the garden that clothed Adam and Eve from their sin and the righteousness that is, in, is clothing us from our own sin, that there still is death involved. There's righteous death. This is why the sages and the rabbis say that it is possible, even though current Judaism d does not believe this om almost across the board, but, but their own sages and rabbis will tell them that it is possible for a Sadiq, if he's righteous enough, he could actually cover the sins of his brethren. And you don't see that today because we don't really want to talk about that Jesus could actually be the Messiah and die for other people's sins. But they see this because, partly because of scriptures like this, that when you're clothed in righteousness, that's an illusion that something died. Someone died so that someone else could live. The blood of something that was sinless had to be shed. And that's why that first animal was the only suitable substitute because both Adam and Eve had fallen into sin. And so that animal was a substitute until a sinless human could give his own life. And I know this sounds basic, but we're going to start off from here so that we can build this concept all the way up to understanding the firstborn. Everything's about the firstborn. A divine firstborn had to pay the penalty for a divine firstborn. How many know that Adam was divine? Adam, in almost in every way, was just like Yeshua. The difference is, is he, didn't, he did not come from before. Adam had a planted time and a beginning. Or as Yeshua had no beginning and no end, according to the Scriptures. He was the Word made flesh. So he pre-existed as the Word and then became flesh. If you have questions on that, I encourage you to get the Trinity on trial. I spend umpteen hours going through all of that. But in the same way that the second Adam was divine in origin, Adam first was also divine in origin. So the only way to pay for Adam's sin was another Adam that didn't sin, which is why the connection is made by the author of Adam second, or Yeshua being the second Adam. Something inferior, listen, cannot pay for something that is superior. Equal weights for equal measures in the Scriptures. This concept, which I could spend a whole hour going over, one of the most important Torah-based principles that you could ever find is equal weights for equal measures. You cannot give an equal punishment for this sin if this sin is lesser. Now, we've all been taught in Christianity that all sin is the same. That is totally not true whatsoever. So let me dispel that right off the bat. It's one of the things that we got wrong. Uh, all sin is not the same. All sin is only the same on the level of it will keep, it out, keep you out of the Shemaim. It will keep you out of the heavens, okay? And so the smallest sin will keep you out from the kingdom of God. So from that perspective, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. But the Torah, the Scriptures from the Genesis to Revelation make it very clear that there are different punishments based on the level of the sin. Do you follow me? And here's the proof. If you want to know how God works, you look at a healthy family and you will see how it works in the earth realm. We are still, praise God, in a position where we can look at a family and still see the hand of God written all over it. How is that? Because when our children do something wrong, if one of them is 16 and a teenager and he's in tremendous rebellion and refuses you know, to, to obey a simple command, there's going to be a much heftier penalty than for if he spills his milk when he's five. You don't beat a child that's not in rebellion. Now some of you are going, well, should I beat him if I'm in rebellion? Okay, well, that's... No, you don't beat a child at all. But my point is, is that there are different levels of, of penalty and punishment in the Scriptures based on the sin that's committed. It's DNA for DNA. I'm going to submit to you that this whole Messiah dying or having to come 
and be a substitute for, for our sin and penalty is because that there was a DNA discrepancy that happened when Adam sinned. There was a perfect light that existed over Adam when he was in the garden. How many remember when Moses was on the mountain and he spent time with God? What, when he came down, what, what happened to his face? It turned into Mr. Edison, right? His light bulb just came on and he was just glowing because he was in the glory of God. God is what? It's light. The Scripture says He's perfect light. And light is every color of the rainbow, by the way. White, perfect white light is every color. And so God is everything, every perfect character and every color, and it drives out all darkness. So it wouldn't be surprising that when, you, when John sees Him in Revelation, sees uh, an angel, what color is He? It's white. Why are all the angels seem to be white? Why is the robe of Messiah white? Because they're in the presence of God absorbing it. What does the Bible say that you're supposed to be? The light of the world. So what does that tell you? You can't paint yourself white. That's what the Pharisees tried to do in the first century. To be, they were whitewashed tombs. They tried in their religion to make themselves look good to the exterior world because that's what they knew inherently on the inside they were supposed to do. But the light that comes from you doesn't come from the outer courts. The light comes from the inner court, the holy of holies. And that only happens when, you have, when you've been in the presence of God. That's why someone can be, you would say, that person's very anointed. Why are they anointed? They spend probably more time in the presence of God than you do or someone else. So there's a DNA discrepancy that happens because the light is all over Adam and Eve. Then what happens? They eat from the tree the knowledge of good and evil, and that firstborn dies. The first time ever that his creation absorbs something that is unholy, it creates a darkness, and what happens when you blow on a candle? The light goes out. So the light goes out because the Spirit of the living God had to remove itself from the presence of the garden. He couldn't be where sin exists. The moment that the light moved away from Adam, the reflection dimmed and Adam could see that he was naked. You see, they never saw their skin before. They never saw their body parts before. No different than the Israelites looked at Moses. They couldn't see anything because the face was so bright. I suggest Adam and Eve were identical. They only saw their nakedness because of the sin. Shame doesn't come when you're walking in righteousness, ladies and gentlemen. But the DNA began to change. Why? Because the light was removed. We talk about healing. People want to be healed. How do people get healed? They come and they touch the presence of God. It's not necessarily that God from the earth realm, from the heavenly realm is just blinking and people are getting healed. There's something that's happening in the spiritual realm you can't see. Literally the light of God is penetrating their bodies, forcing the sickness to leave. The DNA gets fixed. So here we go, let's move along. In order for Adam to continue to serve Yahweh, Adam must be redeemed by blood. There's no way for him to continue to even exist if he is not redeemed by blood because death is what the Bible calls for when there is sin. And how is that, by the way? Why is, is God killing, wants, does God want to kill Adam in the garden? No! So why does the Bible say that death is what happens when we sin? Because he makes it clear, I cannot exist in the presence of sin. I am light. And what happens, by the way, how does he hold the universe together? What's the Bible say? By what? His word. His word is the frequency. The light comes from his mouth like a sword, and it holds together the universe. So if he ever stops speaking, and the light stops emanating from him, the worlds fall apart. What's that called? Death. So when we sin, let, the light of God begins to move away from us in, in a way, and it creates darkness, and where Yahweh's not, death is. That's how death happens. It's not that God decides to kill you. It's that the light 
begins to move away from you and you begin to feel that darkness. So all this setting up that, that Adam had to be redeemed by blood. So let's get into Exodus chapter 13, verse 11. It says this about the firstborn. It shall be when Yahweh brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to Yahweh all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. Numbers 18, 15 says, Everything that first opens the womb of all flesh, which they bring to the Lord, whether man or beast, shall be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man you shall surely redeem, and the firstborn of unclean animals also you shall redeem. So there is a concept all the way back here that there is a, a, a redemption process. When a male child is born for the first time that opens the womb, there is a redemption that has to happen. You have to take it back. You have to pay for it because it's God's. And we're going to get into uh, some of the details of this in a moment. Continuing, and those redeemed of the devoted things. So the males that open the womb for the first time, that's devoted unto Yahweh. You shall redeem when one month old, according to your valuation, for five shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, which is 20 geras. So they were allowed to take back the firstborn from God, basically from, from, from the, the, the death sentence that's on their life. They could redeem them from the payment. And someone say, well, what, where is it coming from? This is all about Adam. All of this is about Adam. Someone has got to pay for Adam's sin, and it hasn't happened yet. So the firstborn, he knows, is the only one that can pay for a firstborn sin. The purity of the firstborn. But every male child that's born is set apart, if you will, for Adam to pay for his sin, but he can't. So he says, you can redeem them from the death penalty. And he creates this process. He dedicates them. Luke 2.22, we see this with our Messiah. Now, when the days of the purification according to the Torah were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it's written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And Yeshua was the first male child born to Mary, so the Torah applies here. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now, what's so interesting is that is not uh, what the law of the Lord says. If you look that up, it is the second part of what the law of the Lord says. It does not say the law of the Lord says bring a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. The requirement is that there is a lamb that must die. A lamb must be slain. But if you are poor, you can bring two turtle doves. And so this instantly tells us the, the status, uh, wealth status of Mary and Joseph is that they are not rich. They are poor. They can't even afford to purchase a lamb to redeem Yeshua. They have to use two turtle doves. But the requirement, interestingly, is a lamb must be slain for the firstborn. Have you ever heard of the scripture that says, before the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain? Okay. So before the earth was even made, the lamb was slain for Adam. It's all, this is all about Adam. Most of the script, the entire ceremonial system and the sacrificial system is set up to temporarily ward off God's wrath from destroying Adam. Now you might say, well, that's really strange, Jim. Think about it. If God kills Adam in the garden... You're not here. So we thank God that He created a system to temporarily ward off His wrath towards Adam 6,000 years ago. The whole system is set up so that you could come into existence. So redemption comes from the Lamb. The Lamb of God, 1 Peter 1.18. You know these scriptures. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with precious blood of Christ as a lamb 
without blemish and without spot. Direct allusion to Pesach right here. The Passover was required that you had a lamb of the first year, perfect, without blemish, without spot. Had to be uh, purchased and it had to be sacrificed. The interesting thing about the Passover lamb is that it was a memorial sacrifice. It did nothing to remove sins whatsoever. It was called upon by Yahweh to his people. You shall do this as a remembrance of you leaving Egypt. The interesting thing is if you read uh, Jewish commentaries and ancient uh, 1,000, 1,500-year-old commentaries from these rabbis, they all saw Passover, the first day of unleavened bread, as the beginning of a new covenant. Unbelievable. Not something that you're going to see in modern Judaism teachings is that Passover was the beginning of a new covenant. They didn't know when, but Passover was going to be, they foresaw, the beginning of a new covenant. And sure enough, it was. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and following says, He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God. Listen, the firstborn over all creation. And He is the head of the body, the ecclesia, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have preeminence. So from Adam to Adam in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, it says this, And so it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So remember what happened. Adam was not created with life. Adam was created and he was laying on his back. And what did Yahweh have to do? He had to do CPR. So God does CPR on Adam and blows life into him. And it says, Adam became a living nefesh, a living soul. His mind, will, and emotions became alive from the Spirit of God. Prophetically, an amazing thing. Until you have the Spirit of God breathe inside of you, you're really dead. You're not alive. And even when you are alive, you need Him to constantly be breathing inside of you, that fresh, nobody likes stale air right? This is why we love spring. You open the windows, amazingly, people, we just love that smell. We love that fresh air. You're supposed to have the fresh manna from God. There's a connection from Adam to Yeshua, and I know that sounds basic, but I think we're going to go a little deeper to discover why there is such an intimate connection and why the authors say that their both names are Adam. Yeshua is called Adam. Adam is called Adam. Does anybody know, I should have put this in the Paleo-Hebrew to show you this, but does anybody know what Adam means? It means divine blood. Okay? And so that's why they're both called Adam. Is one of the interpretation or one of the, the meanings for Adam, Adam, is blood, divine blood. Titus 2.14 says, Who gave himself up for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous for good work. So he's, he's redeeming us, but then requiring something of us. So when you hear the word redeem, if you're an Israelite, you know exactly what it means. And we're going to discover what that means right now. The word kinsman redeemer, this is critical. This is an ancient concept, uh, a rule, a law in every Israelite city of a requirement that when a, hus- or when a husband died and left his wife widowed with no children, it was a requirement in the law that the nearest kinsman had to marry her and give her a child and take care of her. But not just that. So when a husband dies and leaves a wife with no firstborn son to carry on his name, it is the obligation of the next nearest kin to take her as a wife and give her a son to carry on the family name. Now you might say, everybody think of your sister-in-law right now. Right? Okay, you can stop thinking about that. But if this was 4,000 years ago and your sister-in-law's husband died with no firstborn son, you would be required to take care of her and give her a firstborn son. Why? Because they lived in different cultural times where it was agricultural. It was very, very difficult 
to survive. They, they, they did, you couldn't survive without a farm, without uh, bringing an income of some sort. And so if a, a wives back then were, in, a, in many ways, like wives today, they're dependent in many ways on the income of the husband, especially back then, almost 100%. Wives' roles thousands of years ago were set in the home. They worked like crazy on the farm with their husband, but child rearing was what they desired, is what was required. You couldn't survive with it. Why, why do you think they had six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve kids? The more kids you had, the larger the farm that you could have. The more income you could generate, the larger the inheritance would go to your children. So if you had a husband and your husband died, you're destitute. There's no welfare system set up outside of the welfare system that God set up. And this was it. The welfare system was that you're going to be taken care of by your next closest of kin because you had to have a son. The son was the one that carried on the name that had the rights to the inheritance. Okay? This is why it's so critical that God says that we raise up our children in the way that they should go. Because if we, God does not have a firstborn son, if you will, spiritually speaking, there's nothing to carry on His name. Who's going to carry on His name? It's critical that we get theology right, that we understand what the Bible says, and we raise up our children in the way that they should go. It's also an obligation for him to redeem any land. So let's say that, that because the husband dies, he can't pay for the land. It is the requirement of the next kinsman uh, redeemer to pay for the land, to buy the land. Now, why is that so important today? That's not important at all. If, if a you know, wife loses her husband, she loses her house, you know, so be it. Uh, that's kind of our attitude in America. But the reality is back then, it was God that gave the land to the different tribes. So imagine if you had a tribe where there was a, a, a war and a lot of people in the tribe of Asher, a lot of men died and left their wives uh, you know, widowed with no children. It would be very easy for the tribe of Dan that maybe was in, in the back of the war this time to come in and start buying up all the land. Do you see where this is going? And now we've doubled or tripled the size of the property of the Danites while the Asherites shrink the inheritance and it wouldn't be generations very long before there's absolutely no land for, for, for the children of Asher. Does that make sense? So God created this beautiful deeding system that said you're required to buy the land to keep it in the tribal uh, territories that I set up. God was looking all the way down into the future from generations to generations. Not only the land, but He's also required to be the avenger of blood. You know what the avenger of blood is? Here's what the avenger of blood is. We're going to learn a couple things tonight. Uh, in God's system, if you killed a man, you were in big trouble. Just like it is today, but here's the way it worked. There were cities set up called cities of refuge. And if you killed a man, you could flee to the city of, uh, closest city of refuge. But as you're running, the avenger of blood is following you and tracking you and has the legal right to take your life. Manslaughter or not, it doesn't matter. If he catches you before you get to the city gates, he can kill you. And so this was a serious thing, and everybody knew it. So if John kills Joe after Passover, and they had a little bit too much to drink, Joe's brother, his nearest kin, has the obligation to avenge the blood of his brother by going after the one that killed him. This was the system that was set up. This prevents you from killing someone uh, and getting away with it. Because the law allowed you to avenge their blood, which prevented people. The God system prevents crime. You give harsh enough penalties, you empty the prisons. It's that simple. So what happened is the kinsman redeemer is not supposed to, he's required to go after and avenge the blood of his, uh, of the, of the, of his nearest kin that died. And you see this beautiful thing playing out. Here's the four, excuse me, the four rules of redemption. Number one, he must be near of kin. Number two, 
he must be able to redeem and free of any calamity or need of redemption himself. So he's got to be able uh, to do this. He must be willing to redeem. And so that's something that, listen, most of us in this room, if we were honest, if something happened, we would not want to take the wife of our, of our brother uh, or redeem the land. We couldn't do it. So it was difficult to get all of these requirements in alignment. They, had, they were required to, but they had to be able to uh, make all of these requirements fulfilled. And lastly, the redemption was completed when the price was completely paid. So that a price had to be paid, he had to be willing to redeem, he had to be able to redeem, and he had to be nearest of kin. So here's the redemption connection. Why did Jesus, why did Yeshua have to redeem, and why is he the only one that could redeem Adam? He came to redeem the world from our perspective. But from his perspective, he's redeeming his bride. But how? By redeeming his nearest of kin. The only one near Adam with his DNA bloodline is the Messiah. He's Adam too. Does this make sense? So let's go through the four. Yeshua is our nearest of kin, but more importantly, he's Adam's nearest of kin. Nobody matches the DNA closer than Messiah. Number two, Yeshua was able to redeem because he had no bondage himself. He was not in need of any redemption. You see, the laws of the kinsman redeemer, this is why the sacrificial system of the animals had to go into effect. It had to be there because the requirement was that no man could redeem another man if he needed redeeming himself. And every one of us need redemption. We've broken the laws of God. We have killed because the wages of sin is death. We've all murdered. We've all broken. We've all had adultery. We're all thieves. We've all done everything. We are needing redemption, which none of us could pay for Adam's sin. The Messiah is the only one that has the right and is able. So he fulfills the fact that he's nearest kin. He fulfills the requirement that he is able. And number three, he was willing. And this one is probably the most difficult. Because you can have the ability, you can be able and you can be nearest of kin, but you know, I really don't want to do that. How many remember the story of Ruth and Boaz, right? Ruth and Boaz sit at the city courts, the city gates, which is where the courts were. Boaz wants to redeem Ruth, but there's a slight problem. He's not the nearest of kin. Who's the nearest of kin? His uncle, Elimelech's brother, which is Naomi's husband. So they bring, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but they bring Elimelech's brother, who's nearest to kin, up to the city gate, and they say, here's the deal. You are the nearest of kin. You have to buy the land, which he wanted. He wanted to buy the land, but if he had to buy the land according to the law, he had to marry her. And so he was all for buying the land, but when he took one look at that Moabite woman, he said, not a happening. Not going to happen. I am not marrying a foreigner. I don't care if I really want that land. I'm not going to do it. And so the requirement in that time was he had to take his shoe off and he had to give it to Boaz, basically saying, I am submitting and I am relinquishing my kinsman redeemer rights you go for it. And Boaz and party took a, a big celebration at that moment because he really wanted to marry uh, Ruth. And that, by the way, was one of the most beautiful pictures of redemption in the entire Bible. Do you know why? Because according to the law of God, they're not even required. Uh, uh, they're not, uh, uh, they cannot marry a Moabite woman. She's a foreigner, but they're living in the dispersion. And Naomi's sons took Moabite women. And what happened to Ruth? She said, where you go, Naomi, I will go. 
Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. At that moment, she prayed the sinner's prayer. Didn't even know it. Probably the first sinner's prayer ever prayed in the Bible. She accepted Jesus in her heart. Really, and the truth of the matter is, is that she gave her life to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And at that moment, she was no longer a Moabite. According to the Torah and the law of God, that if anybody comes in and sojourns with you and they circumcise themselves, and in this case their heart, and they, and they do my ways and not their ways, they shall be as a native-born citizen. That's what the scriptures say. So for all the naysayers to say, no, 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 Christ cannot be in the lineage of Ruth because she's a Moabite, they don't know their own Torah. The Torah gives precedent for this. She's not a Moabitess anymore. And how beautiful is this redemption? Because do you know who the son of Ruth is? It's Obed. And do you know who the son of Obed is? It's Jesse. And do you know who the son of Jesse is? King David. If Boaz doesn't redeem Ruth, the Messiah can't redeem Adam. Don't tell me that one man's decision is not important. Young people, listen to me. The decision of who you marry is critical. Generations depend and are depending on the decisions that you make. Do not make them from emotion. That's a subject for a whole nother message. But I want to point out to you young people that are listening, that want to do Bible things in Bible ways, if you remotely look like the system of the world and you move into the system of the world of finding a mate, don't be surprised if you receive the results of the world. There is a different way. So Yeshua, back to the connection. He was nearest of kin. He was able to redeem. He was willing to redeem. And more importantly, He completely paid the required price for the land. And, and He was also the avenger of the blood. Because we say this all the time in Christianity. That he def Remember the prophecy in Genesis about the serpent? You know, strike the heel, his head's going to be crushed. You know what that's talking about? The serpent killed Adam. Only the nearest kin has the right to destroy the serpent. You catch that? Yeshua is the nearest kinsman redeemer and only Him has the legal authority to destroy the one who killed His brother. That's why Yeshua did all of these things in one. He avenged the blood of Adam in His own death. And He will also redeem the land. Adam sold himself into slavery. We do this to ourselves. He sold himself into slavery by submitting to a lie. Israel sold herself into slavery in Egypt. The Israelites chose to enslave themselves to kings and priests, and we choose to enslave ourselves. The whole kinsman redeemer process is to free us from slavery. Romans chapter 6, verse 17, the following says, But thanks to be to God that uh, through... Though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to whom you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Listen to this, because this is a kind of a strange scripture. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Now time out, back the truck up, we've got something to talk about here. Slaves of control of righteousness? That sounds like legalism. Ladies and gentlemen, the robe of righteousness is supposed to control you. If you take off righteousness, 
you're out of control from God's perspective. The only one in the world that you want to control you is Yahweh. You want Him to control you. I want Him to, how many have said, now it sounds weird in American English to say, I I want God to control me, but let me say it differently to hit your spirit more properly. How many would say, I want Yahweh to have full control? That's exactly what we're supposed to have. So when you're a slave to sin and you're in bondage, righteousness has no control. You're free. It's a strange way of saying it, but I think it's beautiful. You're free from the control of righteousness, which by default means that you are in bondage and free to sin. That's why it says that those who are clothed in righteousness sin no more because they're under the control of a different master. This is why when someone says to me, Jim, I want you to pray for my husband. I say, is he a believer? Well, he, you know, I said, can, can you get him to sit down and watch a, a video with you? No, he, he's not interested in watching videos. He's not interested in, he, he, you know, in, in reading the scriptures with me. I just call a spade a spade. He's probably not saved. Because my Bible tells me that when you have the robe of righteousness on and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, deep calls to deep and you desire God. If you have no desire for God and you have no desire to read His Word and you have no control over the, over the members of your body, you're probably under the control of your father, the devil. But we don't want to call a spade a spade because we live in, a, in, in America where everybody's got to be, you know, just no judgment, don't judge me. I give you full permission, judge me, because I'd rather you judge me than him. Say what you see. I want to get fixed now. I don't want to stand before God, you know, as I've held my secrets before men, because when I stand before him, he's going to bring them all out for everybody to see anyway, and I don't want you getting the DVD of my life. Do you? You don't want your DV of your past, uh, you know, passing out. You don't want it on Netflix. Watch Cindy John's life, 99 cent download. I'd rather get it straight now. So the second redeems the first. There's a precedent of the second redeeming the first. That's why you see this all through the scriptures. We're almost finished. Abel's blood redeems his firstborn brother Cain through the second Abel, Seth, which will bring forth the Messiah. Isaac is the second born. He carries the blessing. Redeems the whole family name. Jacob is the second born. Joseph is the second firstborn to Reuben. He's the firstborn to Rachel. That's why he gets the inheritance. And Joseph, it's Joseph that buys back the family and redeems them in Egypt. Manasseh, the firstborn, is put aside and redeemed by secondborn Ephraim. And then you have the twin sons of Tamar. How many know the story of Tamar in Judah? All right, watch this. This is kind of amazing. It's Genesis chapter 38, if I remember right. It's a story that you're just not going to find heard preached in church much, okay? It's a strange story. But Judah, one of the sons of Jacob, fourth uh, born, uh, has two sons, and his sons marry, and, uh, and then his oldest son dies. And Tamar is left without a husband. So the requirement is what? We just went through this. The next son is required to take Tamar as a wife. So he goes to take Tamar as a wife, but he decides, you know, I'm not going to put my seed inside of her. And he decides not to do that. And the scriptures say that God kills him for that because he didn't redeem like he was required to. He could not see that the entire rest of the world was hinging on this moment right here. The line of the Messiah was hinging on this moment. He didn't do it, so he dies. Now we got a big problem. There's only one son left, and he's really young. So Tamar says, hey, I, I, I have to be redeemed. I need to have a son. The requirement is that his youngest son is supposed to marry Tamar, but he can't. He's too young. So Judah says, just hold on. Just wait till he gets older, and then I will give you uh, him as your husband. So Tamar, being a, being a brilliant woman, as most are, she says, you know, 
I about had enough of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use my wits. I'm going to take off my grieving gowns, and I'm going to put on the best, nicest dress that I've got, and I'm going to sit outside the gate, and I'm going to put a veil on, and Judah's not going to know who I am, but I'm going to be very attractive to him. And he came into her and laid with her and couldn't afford to pay her, so he promised to give her a sheep, an animal. And she requires of him, if you're going to do that, she, she had this all planned out, I need you to give me something. So he gave her his signet ring and a, a cord and his staff, if I recall properly. There were three items to prove so that he would come back So it was and pay her, make sure that she got paid. Little did he know that he just gave his daughter-in-law a son. So Tamar comes back and eventually Tamar starts showing And they realize that she's pregnant, but she doesn't have a husband, which is against the law of God. And what do you do to an adulteress? You stone her. And so Judah says, it's time to stone her. Finally, I'm going to get rid of this problem. And who's the husband anyway? And Tamar says, well, it's whoever owns these. Dad. Wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall to see how red his face got? is his entire clan is packed around and everybody looks at Judah. And then they look down going, oh boy, this is awkward. And Judah said this, she is more righteous than I. And he never laid with her again, but she bore a son. She bore twin sons. And this is what their names were. Ferrets was the first one. He was the firstborn. And in Paleo-Hebrew, okay, you have uh, the pay and the resh and sion. And it means the mouth and the head lies down as in need. Okay? And so just hold on to that for a second. Ferrets, uh, so if you remember the, the, the story, uh, the firstborn sticks his hand out in the birth canal and they tie a scarlet thread to it, right? To indicate that's the firstborn. But he decides, you know, I'm kind of warm in here. I don't want to come out. And his brother decides to come out instead. So the second born is born first. But it's the first born that has the scarlet thread. That's actually the first born. So the second born is actually the first born. You follow me? Okay. So Ferris is the one that doesn't have the thread. Zerah is the second born, but he's the one that actually should have been the first born. He has a scarlet red thread. And what is his name? Is plow, sword, crowned vav, okay? The head of revelation. Sign Resh Hey, a head of revelation. The plow or the sword is the head of revelation. So much more firstborn name. And so what happens when the secondborn redeems the firstborn, it takes the last letter, look at this one, okay? The iron, and which is lying down, and it's going to lift it up. Because the last letter in Zara's name is the hey which is to lift up or to bring revelation, to behold. So watch what happens to the name when it changes. It turns into this. The scarlet thread is put on the second born, the arm of Yahweh, Yeshua, which ends up redeeming his twin and lifts him up. This is this whole story. Yeshua is the second born, Adam, but technically, because before time he was there, he's the first born. So the second born, which has the scarlet thread, Yeshua, is actually the one that's going to redeem the first born from our perspective. And when that happens, he changes the name to Pei Resh Hey. The mouth is the head that reveals. And that name is the fundamental foundation cornerstone of the word Pharaoh. Now you've all been taught that Pharaoh is a bad word. Because that's where we get it. But no, pharaohs could be really good. Remember when God said, sometimes you're going to get a good king. You're going to have a good pharaoh. And sometimes you're not ever going to get a good. But pharaoh means the mouth and the head that reveals, that brings revelation. So he took 
the firstborn Adam who sinned, and he lifts him up and makes him a king. That's what the second Adam is doing. Yeshua, the secondborn, lifts up the firstborn so that he can be the mouth of the head that reveals. You see, every one of you have been falling short of the glory of God. You've literally fallen, but God through the Messiah is lifting you up so that you could be the mouth of the head. Someone will say amen at some point in this message, I'm convinced. (laughs) Either I've totally lost you, I don't know. So what happens? The Levites take the priesthood. But the priesthood started with the firstborn Adam. It did not start with Levi. The priesthood started with the firstborn. It was the firstborn that was set aside. Then it was given to Levi to make atonement for the sons of Adam until the nearest of kin could redeem him. Because what happened at the base of Mount Sinai? They had the golden calf incident, right? 3,000 people were dead. What tribe did not take part in that? The tribe of Levi. So when God says, I'm going to set aside the firstborn, he says, I want you to count all the firstborns of Israel. There's 22,663 firstborn, if I remember right, in all of Israel. 22,600 something Israelites that are firstborn. And he says, I'm going to let you redeem those. I want Levi. And there just so happened to be 22,000 of them. So he makes a trade and says, okay, instead of killing all of them, which is what I wanted to do, I'm going to let you redeem them for a price, but I'm taking the tribe of Levi Levi, in your place. You see, what is not taught so much in the redemption of the firstborn is Levi himself, the entire tribe, was a sacrifice to protect the firstborn of Israel. Which was to protect the firstborn creation, which was Adam. So this whole thing is a setup to redeem Adam. The priesthood started with Adam. It was supposed to be everyone. Then they blew it, and he said, only the firstborn can redeem Adam. So I want only the firstborn. But then he says, nope, because you guys are not Kadosh, and you decided to do the whole golden calf thing, I'm not even, I don't even want the firstborn anymore. I want to kill all them people. I'm going to take the ones that didn't, that are still holy. Levi, firstborn which is not the firstborn, but they're standing in the gap for the firstborn until the nearest of kin could redeem. You see how the the problem gets keep complicated. Everybody keeps sinning, and the nearest of kin just goes down the drain. Nobody's holy. I can't even find one, the Bible says. It is righteous. Yeshua, as the second Adam, the second born, redeems the firstborn. When he comes, ladies and gentlemen, this is why he says that I come in the order of Melchizedek. I, he is the high priest in the order of the Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. The first king of righteousness was Adam. Adam was given king rulership of the world. So much so he had the right to name the animals. But he gave the signet ring to Hasatan. And the moment he took the ring off, The light stopped, if you will, and he died. No one could redeem Adam. And everyone out from Adam's loins, born into death, because they're not born as children of the light. They're born into a world of corruption. And the only way to save them retroactively, this is why, by the way, there is a heavenly temple. There cannot be just an earthly temple. There has to be a heavenly temple. Do you know why? God doesn't need, why does he need a heavenly temple? Because this one is only good for in our time space continuum. It redeems those who are alive now. But when the blood is taken from the cross on Passover and it's taken to the heavenly temple and it's put on the horns of the altar and it's sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant in the the temple of all temples, it is outside of time. And when that blood is shed, ladies and gentlemen, it hits the ground. And when Messiah raises from the dead and he goes into the heavenly temple as the firstborn of all creation, he's literally paying at that moment outside of time for the blood of Adam. 
He's redeeming the firstborn. Listen, because it's all going to come together. When he redeems the firstborn king, you retroactively, outside of time, every progeny from Adam to today are all kings and priests. It's all outside of time. This is why he says, I am the high priest in the order of the Malkitzedek, Adam. I am in his lineage. And if anyone dies in my blood, shed for them, they too are in my lineage and they are a king and a priest in my order. It does not take away from the fact that God says in the millennium that he has a plan for Levi. But Levi, listen, is not a king. They are servants in the temple. Highly needed. But God says there is one higher. It is in the order how far back you want to go. I don't want to go to Mount Sinai. I want to go all the way back to the king of Salem. And I want to be one of those. I want to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb before the creation of time. I want to walk with my crown of righteousness and my robe of righteousness that will change me daily. I want to walk in the light of God. Amen? And all of this begins with Passover. It all begins with the Passover. This entire beautiful feast day of the Lord. The first one, by the way, could have made it the third. That would have been cool too. But He made it the first. Because the very first thing that is required if you're going to operate in your royal robes is you must be crowned as king. You have no right or authority to operate in your biblical realm and authority without a crown. And do you know what your crown is? It's a crown of thorns. Why do you think he was crowned? Why do you think it said, Yeshua, here, the King of the Jews? Did you know? I was going to save this for some special teaching, but in historical documents, you can track down that in the first century, there was no King of the Jews. There was disputes because of the four sons. No one was called King. The entire generation. That's why I said, here, Here's your king. How interesting. There's no king of the Jews. He actually is the king of the Jews. And he's crowned with a crown of thorns because the only thing that initiates and inaugurates you into your service is blood. And for you to have a crown, for you to have the authority that God wants you to have, you must die. You must bleed. And you know where, what affects us most in our walks with God? Right here. In golf, it's called the game of seven inches. What happens between your ears affects everything. So it must be crucified. That's why it says, you must be crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is not I who live but Christ in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith according to the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to be the king of your house? Die. You want to be the most used person in your county? Be the one who gives up your life first. Submit to the authority that God has placed in your life. Stand with me, please. Although the significance of the Passover lamb is unprecedented in every way because it redeems Adam and when it redeems Adam it redeems all of his progeny all the way to us giving anybody that aligns themselves and agrees with that sacrifice the right to become royalty. The right. But what gives you power and authority over the enemy in your life is the crown of thorns. Most of us don't like the feeling of thorns on our brow. This is why over and over we have talked about trials and tribulations. 
You can't be king unless you obey. And how do you learn obedience? Through suffering. We all want to be kings, but we don't want to do anything that a king has to do to get to his authority, to get the crown. We all just say, I believe in Jesus, God, give me my crown. Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you right now, I will be taking whatever crown that God gives me on Judgment Day and I will be laying it at His feet. It is worthless in the presence of the Most High. We don't seek crowns of gold and silver. That's for Him. We must learn suffering and praise Him in the process. We have forgotten, ladies and gentlemen, the power of the Passover lamb is not in its life, it's in its death. So when all you're seeking for life and prosperity and success, you can get it from the world, but it grows wings. But if you want the Solomon blessing of the early years, you simply say, God, I don't care about anything but your people. Just give me wisdom to lead my family. I don't know how to do this. But just give me wisdom. Show me how to do this. It's the only thing I want in life. Is I want your kingdom to come. I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the glory and the power forever and ever. Do we really live that? Do we believe that? Some of us, listen, this message can be hard in a way because God's tired of pawns. If you have a full army, you have to have rooks and bishops, queens and kings. Where are they? You can't win a war with pawns only. He needs everyone to step up to their plate. Some of you are feeling the call right now that you know you are called to go further. You're not giving your all. I challenge you like I challenged someone this week. Ask the Father, Lord, what would you have me do? I will leave my net. I will drop it in a heartbeat because you are the only thing that matters. I want to be a king Not for prestigiousness sake. Because I want to help build your kingdom. Don't be a watcher. Don't be a viewer. Because you know where the watchers are? They're on the wall. You can fall off the wall as much as you're on it. Be a worker in the kingdom. Let the angels watch. They don't fall. Let's pray. Father Yahweh, we come before you and we say, Lord, thank you for the Passover lamb. We thank you, Father, for redeeming your firstborn child. Lord, for so many years, Lord, I, uh, in joking manner, God, I was mad at Adam. How could he let this happen? Not even remotely thinking that he was in a serious situation of never being redeemed. Lord, it... it, it it deepens my understanding to know that you came, you sent your son, your only begotten son, to die for one single person, 33 years on this life, for one. Your love is so grand, you came and died for one, and through one, you saved all. Father, oh, what it would be like if we had the love for our brethren to redeem them in hard situations. What would it be like, God, if we helped save someone's house, their property, their family in a destitute situation? What would it be like if your church was filled with people that just gave like the Redeemer did? to save. 
Lord, I pray in Yeshua's name that you would encourage the downtrodden right now and recognize that you want to sup with them. Your blood was shed for them. And if they would just receive you right now, they too would be saved. Make the difference in someone's heart right now, God. If that's you tonight and you're thinking, if I died right now, I don't even know where I would go. With every head bowed and eyes closed, I just want you to, I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand right now. But just say, Father, come into my life. I recognize I'm a sinner. I know that if I died right now, Lord, I know that I am not your child. I agree with the blood of your son being shed for me. I have made too many mistakes. I want to know you. Come into my life. Please don't pass me by. Today could be my last day. Come in to my life and make me a new Adam. Redeem me from my own self. Make me a new creation. Take me where I need to be. Put the crown on my head of thorns. I will serve you all the days of my life if you let me live with you in your kingdom. God, teach me how to serve you. And I will obey. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, if that was you and you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up so I know to pray for you? Thank you. Anybody else in the room? If that's you online, I encourage you to send us a email and let us know that you just accepted the Messiah into your life. The angels said they're rejoicing. And let me tell you something. If you seek the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, in one year from now, you won't even recognize yourself because you will be opening up the water from heaven to wash you clean. The Bible says if you prayed that prayer and you meant it and you walk behind your rabbi, you are saved. Now walk like your rabbi walked. Amen. God, I thank you for tonight. I pray that you would bless your people, Lord, from the ends of the earth. Make them like you. So may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May his countenance be lifted up over you. And when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, no matter what's happening in your life, Father, I pray you bring shalom.